Hi friends, my name is Tris, and this is No Boilerplate, focusing on fast, technical videos. Everyone knows that GPT and AI are going to change the world, but how? I have a few ideas to share with you that I've not seen elsewhere, and it starts with beer. As ever, everything you see in this video, from the script to the images, are part of a Markdown document available on GitHub under a public domain license. One of my favourite facts, historically, is that we don't know which came first, bread or beer. We either loved bread so much we accidentally made beer, or we loved beer so much we accidentally made bread. The origins of bread and beer are lost to prehistory. Both are astonishing pieces of technology, though we don't think of them as such. Clean water, especially in the cities, used to be very hard to come by. Wells and rivers would be poisoned by proximity to sewers, and the only well-known safe drinks were alcoholic. As we know now, it was the boiling of the water to make these drinks that made them safe. Well, some were safer than others. If you wanted to get mental work done, beer was better than gin, as Hogarth noted. But a new drink entered Europe in the late 14th century. Coffee. The first coffee houses in Constantinople were opened in 1475. While better historians than me will tell you the myriad causes of the European Renaissance, the factor I really like is it happened just after Europeans stopped day drinking beer as their only safe option. As my flawless logic shows, coffee got us Wi-Fi and continues to power engineers to this day. And it's all because it allowed us to get more work done. We are now at the start of a second Renaissance. Though the name of my video comes from fiction, where in the Animatrix the second renaissance was the birth of AI, in our own reality, our second renaissance is GPT. Though GPT has been quietly changing the world for five years, there was a surge in public interest following the release of DALI at the start of 2021. Machine learning models were no longer abstract concepts that only nerds like me got overexcited about. Their power was clear to anyone. It was obvious that this technology would change the world in some way. Infinitely generated artwork in whatever style you would like certainly would turn the art world upside down, but it was the launch of ChatGPT, however, that changed the rest of the world. Here it's writing a video script about itself in the style of the excellent edutuber CGP Grey, or thereabouts. I think Grey is safe, for now. You ask this oracle to tell you anything, and it will answer. Sometimes it is right, sometimes it is not. It's always very confident, and you need to be very careful. What does this mean for us, as a society, as humans? Though GPT is not AI in the pure sense of the word, it is a very powerful machine learning technique. The original paper on generative pre-trained transformers was written by Alec Radford and his colleagues, and published on OpenAI's website on June 11th, 2018. As of time of recording, there are three versions of GPT, with GPT 3.5 powering the chat GPT conversation you see here, and version 4 coming out this year. Theoretically, we can ask GPT anything. How to bake a cake, how to learn trigonometry, how to best revise for an exam, but also how to cheat on that exam, how to run a country, or which cities to bomb for maximum effect in a total war. The tool finds patterns in existing data, and has been given the largest corpus of data we have ever accumulated. The internet, circa 2021, or large portions of it. The problem with this genie, with this oracle, with this magic mirror on the wall, is that it can just as easily provide both sides of an argument, like here. It's got some valid sounding points on how nuclear power's image can be improved, and if you reword your question, it gives you the other side of the story, how nuclear power can be vilified. The model is trained on all sides of all arguments, and it can present them in a very coherent, persuasive manner. ChatGPT has been trained on all kinds of data, newspapers, books, song lyrics, programming code, anything that can be expressed in words. And now we come to the problems. The language model has been trained on society's existing text, which includes all of society's biases, like here, that middle-aged people should be paid more than younger people. Sure, this might be very typical in many fields, but it gets worse. Society's biases about how men and women should be paid also feature here. This is not ChatGPT malfunctioning, this is it accurately mimicking the data it has been trained on, and it gets much worse. The results of the algorithm are given with no context, no thought to fairness or even correctness. This is a very powerful tool, but an amoral one. We must learn, as a society and individually, how to use it. And we must learn today. By the way, for those who would prefer to support my work via YouTube instead of Patreon, I have just enabled channel membership. Same VIP Discord and early video benefits as Patreon, but you also get a badge next to your name in YouTube comments. Thanks so much. This is how we should think of GPT tools, I believe. Think of them as research assistants, as interns, as free helpers in whatever you are doing. And just like interns, they're not always right, but they are enthusiastic and confident when delivering their work. You have to ask the right questions and make sure you have given them all the context they need to do their job. 
If they get the wrong answer, it's not their fault. You need to ask clearer questions with more context. So we all get a team of interns. Fine, let's zoom out. What does that mean for our work? A typical organisation has this kind of hierarchy, with executives at the top, workers at the bottom, and a gradient of increasing abstraction in between. In this new world that we are in right now, every layer of the organisation gets their own department of interns. Everyone in the company, everyone in the world, gets a team of interns for so cheap, it might as well be free. What does this mean for our work? What does this mean for productivity? Who gets the benefit? I have an unusual case study for you. This is Hans Zimmer who has composed so much music, his discography has its own Wikipedia page. He is pictured here in his studio, which I must note is designed to look like, in his words, a 19th century Viennese brothel. Zimmer is incredibly prolific and has written the music for an enormous number of films, including the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, Iron Man, Gladiator, Mission Impossible 2, The Last Samurai, Transformers, Hancock, Kingdom of Heaven, The Da Vinci Code, Inception, Sherlock Holmes, and The Dark Knight Trilogy. This is only a highlight. I'm not even scratching the surface. But it's not entirely accurate. This is the home of Zimmer's production company, Remote Control Productions. It's worth noting that RemoteControlProductions.com, somewhat totemically, redirects to HansZimmer.com. A huge number of internationally renowned musicians and composers either work or have worked at Remote Control. Zimmer often works as part of a large team drawn from Remote Control in writing his scores. Sometimes scores are credited to him, other times to the company, and sometimes, confusingly, both. Neither Zimmer nor Remote Control are clear about it. It is possible that for many of the pieces, this army of composers did most of the work, copying Zimmer's style, and then he came in to polish the final draft. And when a GPT product is released that specialises in music creation, Hans Zimmer does not need to be worried, but the composers at Remote Control should be. The horse has bolted, the genie is out of the bottle, imitation is now industrialised. Things are going to be different this year. The last time there was a huge jump in productivity was because of the Industrial Revolution. Instead of string, for example, being spun by hand in cottage industries, the workers were leaving their homes and working the machines instead. But an interesting thing happened. Despite the majority of string not being created by hand, you can still buy some if you want, today. You can still buy handmade string at a market or here on Etsy. Even though machine-made string costs pennies, there's thousands of handmade artisans making a living here. I think the same will happen with AI-made work. Low-effort production gets automated, but handmade, human-made, artisan and artist-made works are still valuable because the people buying them value the human input. The work isn't the art, the art is the art. And that's more than photons received in the eye of the beholder. Artists aren't going to be replaced, there's just going to be a lot of machine-made corporate art around. Authors aren't going to be replaced, there's just going to be a lot of machine-made brochures around. Musicians aren't going to be replaced. They all get an army of helpers, like Hans Zimmer has. This technology is here now, helping writing cooking articles, company advertising copy, and end of quarter profit and loss presentations. It's designing corporate artwork, posters, and stock background images like I have used today. It's not going to do your work for you, but allow you to do whatever you want 1,000 times faster. The question is, what would you do if you could do it all? If you'd like to support my channel, get early ad-free and tracking-free videos and VIP Discord access, head to patreon.com forward slash no boilerplate. If you're interested in transhumanism and hope punk stories, please check out my sci-fi podcast Lost Terminal. Or if urban fantasy is more your bag, click the bottom video to listen to a strange and beautiful podcast I produce called Modem Prometheus. Transcripts and markdown source code are available on GitHub, links in the description, and corrections are in the pinned errata comment. Thank you so much for watching, talk to you on Discord.